50 ways FODS can really hurt Y0U. Surprising ways foods can kill, maim, damage your organs, undermine your brain function and otherwise screw up your life. Dr. Keith Scott Mumby tells you. Based on the book Dietwise www.dietwisebook.com Copyright Copyright 2008 Keith Scott Mumby MD PhD All rights reserved you may share and redistribute this ebook but only if you keep the copyright notice, author's name and website contact details intact. Thank you. Disclaimer This ebook is provided for information and educational purposes only and is not intended to serve as medical advice. The information provided in this ebook should not be used for diagnosing or treating a health problem or disease. It is not a substitute for professional care. If you have or suspect you may have a health problem, you should consult your licensed health care provider. Number 1. Foods can really kill. You probably know that foods can actually kill. Everyone has heard of the sensational cases where an individual have eaten peanut or shellfish, their throat swells, they are rushed to err, uh, but die before they can be resuscitated. But like the majority of the public, you have heard of this type of food allergy and believe that's the only problem with foods. You consider it rare, don't the newspapers and TV keep telling you that? So you ignore it and suppose it has nothing to do with you. Wrong. Harm from foods is virtually universal. We all suffer from it to a greater or lesser degree. And I'm not talking about junk food, I'm talking about natural foods, the kind we all like to eat. This seems counterintuitive, since we are accustomed to thinking of food as something that nourishes and supports us, something necessary for life. That can't be bad, surely? Well, oxygen is essential for life. But it also slowly kills us. That's why we need antioxidants. Oxygen damage to the tissues, like rusting of iron, is a steady decay process that ages us and finally leads to death. So reassurances are out of place. Ignorance of the facts about food can cost you your health and your life. Pay attention to this ebook. Number 2. How to Live 100 Years. True Life Examples, I have always felt, enhance understanding and are easier to remember. Here is an historic tale, from Italy. The central character was a Venetian nobleman called Luigi Cornaro. He was born in 1467, which makes him a contemporary of Michelangelo Bonarotti and Leonardo da Vinci, who were busy, along with numerous others, creating their world-shaking art in Florence as part of the Great Renaissance, literally rebirth. Cornaro started his own shift of consciousness phenomenon, as we shall see. His was more studied and scientific but nonetheless visionary for all that. Through the book Diet Wires his method of rebirth, health and long life, can come true for us all. A typical nobleman of the day, Cornero squandered his considerable fortune on high living, especially food and drink. Unfortunately, his constitution was rather weak and he was racked with symptoms, including indigestion and gout, attended by an almost continuous fever and thirst. He was getting steadily worse. Cornero would probably have died by the age of 40, as most people did in those days. But he was lucky. One of his physicians told him, in no uncertain terms, that he had better sober up his lifestyle or call the undertakers. Shocked by the possibility of imminent death, Cornero decided the smart thing to do was to listen to the doctor's advice, which for once was sound and holistic. He began to experiment and found that he felt better if he ate less and avoided certain foods that seemed to upset his constitution. In fact Cornero was the first person on record to work out his own detox diet. He was pretty smart and realized that the foods he liked or craved were not necessarily the best for him. Cornero found that he did not tolerate fish, pork, melons and other fruits, salad, though he doesn't say what ingredients, rough wines and pastry. Surprisingly, the foods he could tolerate included meats and certain choice wines. He liked an egg, bread and soup. Eat less and eat right was his basic formula. In his case he was able to tolerate 12 ounces of food daily and 14 ounces of decent wine. Within a year he was fully healed, 
zestful and enjoying life. The years rolled by, 50, 60, 70, 80. Apart from a couple of episodes, he remained well. One setback was a serious coach accident at the age of 70, which almost cost him his life. Cornero was dragged from the wreck with many bruises, a dislocated arm and a broken leg. The doctors wanted to bleed him, as if he weren't shocked enough. Cornero wisely refused and relied on his own diet management formula to restore his damaged limbs. It worked. The second near fatality occurred when he broke his diet, at the insistence of concerned relatives. They believed he should fatten himself up, to maintain his strength. As a result of continued nagging he decided to up his rations to 14 ounces of food a day and 16 ounces of wine. Within a week he was peevish and quarreling with all comers. By the tenth day he was seized with a violent pain in his side, which lasted over 22 hours, before being succeeded by a serous fever, which lasted for 35 days. Cornero abandoned the changes and soon recovered. In fact he went on to live an exceptionally long and healthy life. At the amazing age of 83 he published his first treatise, entitled The Sure and Certain Method of Attaining a Long and Healthful Life. The English translation went through numerous editions. He wrote three more pamphlets on the same subject, composed at the ages of 86, 91 and 95 respectively. Luigi Cornero finally died, serene and dignified at the age of 98. What was remarkable about Cornero's achievement was that he lived in an age when the average life expectancy was under 40 years. To live beyond three score years and ten was almost unheard of or never mind reaching two years short of 100. Cornero had clearly made a major discovery in the field of disease and health, you would think the medicos of the day would be won over and want to pass on the good news. Instead they ignored Cornero's remarkable diet experiments. Number 3. From my casebook. Think all this is historic, beyond our era, and irrelevant? Maybe it sounds too extreme. Do you have to be so strict to live to a hundred years? Certainly not. Let me tell you a story from my casebook. Arthur was in his sixties when he first made contact with me. His health had deteriorated to the point where he was lying in bed over twenty hours a day, with scarcely strength to move. His heart was weak and enlarged and he had been waiting for a suitable donor to come along, to provide a transplant. Having heard about me and some of the sensational cures that I had been getting by just excluding certain trigger foods, he asked for help. I put him on exactly the same recommended diet program described in DietWise. Within two weeks he was starting to feel better. Within a month he was not only able to travel but actually drove himself to my office. By the time we had completed testing for food culprits, it became clear that wheat was his number one enemy. When he tried to reintroduce it he collapsed into his earlier debilitated condition. Arthur's ideal diet required him to avoid wheat and one or two lesser banded foods, which he did dutifully. His health recovered to the state where he was fitter than meant ten years his junior. He never had the heart transplant and will never need one, I'm sure. The last time I visited him, before I left the UK for good, I saw Arthur in his home. At the age of 78 he had been erecting a large wooden garden shed. Single-handedly, he had cut timbers, drilled and fixed them, and even put on the roof, which required lifting a considerable weight above his head height. This determined man wanted a small workshop and had decided to build his own. Number 4. How common is the problem? It has been estimated that over half of all illnesses reported to doctors are caused or worsened by food incompatibilities, so this condition is not rare. In my paradigm-busting book Dietwise I share many cases that suffered from apparently incurable diseases, which nevertheless got well following the path I lay out in that book. Afflictions such as brain damage, heart enlargement and infertility may seem to have nothing to do with what a person eats, yet the patient improved dramatically, doing what I told them to do. How can this happen? The important principle is what we call total body load, see next section, if you can reduce the body's problems significantly, nature can often take care of the rest and work an apparently spontaneous healing.
In addition to major named diseases, there is a great deal of minor symptomatology which is not reported at all, everyone considers it normal to have a few aches and pains. Good health is often taken to be the mere absence of disease. Yet abundant energy, well-being, clarity of thinking and zest should be your lot. If this isn't the case, then the advice in my book probably applies to you. You will be astonished just how complex and destructive hidden food reactions can be. I've laid it all out for you in this e-book. Number 5. Body Load. Our bodies can take care of a great deal of stress and abuse. There are healing mechanisms which fix problems before we are even aware of them. If these were not present we should soon sicken and die. In fact what happens is that we only become aware of symptoms when the fixer mechanisms have become overloaded and can no longer cope. Then we get disease. So really, feeling unwell is the end of the line, not the start as doctors like to think. It's already gone wrong by that stage. But the result of continuous overload is not always a major disease. There can be many varied symptoms, all giving warning that things are not right. Often these symptoms are very personal to the individual and can occur in almost endless combinations, see hash 39. Doctors don't like this because they are accustomed only to proper or real diseases that they read about in their textbooks. The truth is we are all in an overload situation to some degree or other. The result is that minor unpleasant symptoms are very common so common that everyone considers them normal. Common they may be but definitely not normal. Unfortunately, the medical profession as a whole is entrenched in the belief that diet is unimportant, despite the fact that Hippocrates over 2000 years ago stated that no healing could be truly successful without attention being paid to what the patient was eating. Instead, the conventional doctor blunders on, with newer and more dangerous drugs, always ready with the scalpel or chemo spurred on by more and more obscure laboratory investigations until the patient is lost in a welter of science. One wonders where it will all end, for whereas in any other profession a narrowness of view is nothing more than an unbecoming failure, in medicine it is a dangerous neglect of duty from which only the patient suffers. A doctor has a certain responsibility to do the best for his or her patient and that means keeping abreast of any area of new knowledge which may help. Understanding food allergies is no longer new or radical. Yet most doctors never approach disease in this way. In my view it should be the first approach to a disease, not the last thing to think of. Number 6. Typical Life History. Let us take a typical life story of a person who is allergic to cow's milk. If bottle fed as a baby there are considerable feeding difficulties. Baby gets a lot of wind and mother gets many sleepless nights. There may be a long period with a runny nose, repeated ear troubles, sore throats, constant colds, and tonsils and adenoids get removed. The adaptive process may become complete from time to time and all symptoms may disappear. The allergic patient may enjoy periods of excellent health when nothing appears to be wrong. But it is quite usual for the patient to have growing pains, to be over or underactive, showing signs of attention deficit disorder. A DD, suffering troublesome headaches and being highly susceptible to infections, with consequent frequent colds and flu like attacks. At puberty, the patient's story may take a dramatic turn, all symptoms may disappear completely, or everything may get worse. When puberty brings trouble, it can come in many forms migraine, asthma, eczema, acne, depression, and behavior problems. Even vandalism can suddenly turn on as a result of the masked allergy becoming partially unmasked. In girls all manner of menstrual problems may be a result of an unsuspected allergy to foods or chemicals. It seems as though the body becomes super sensitive to its own hormones and any variation in the hormone balance occurring at puberty, at menstruation, during pregnancy or at the menopause may all cause symptoms of varying degrees. These symptoms may be premenstrual tension, heavy painful periods, absence of periods, sickness in pregnancy, toxemia of pregnancy, depression after confinement and all those unpleasant symptoms commonly associated with change of life. Number 7. Intolerance and Poisons. It isn't all about allergies. 
Intolerance of foods may be simply a reaction to substances contained in the foods, and individual reactions depend on genetic makeup. Nature has seen fit to endow a number of plants with the capacity to synthesize substances that are toxic to humans and other animals. Farmers and veterinarians have known for years that animals become sick if they graze on certain types of plant. For example, bulls become enraged if they eat loco weed, loco being Spanish for crazy. Many plant substances are toxic to humans in quite small quantities, including deadly nightshade, acorns and hemlock. Ricin, the toxic principle in castor bin, Ricinus communis, is one of the most poisonous substances known. A minute drop in a needle on the tip of an umbrella was used in an infamous political assassination on the streets of London in 1978, the slaying of Bulgarian dissident Georgi Markov. Number 8. Poisons in Foods. The fact is that all plants, including edible ones, contain quantities of poisons. Carrots, for example, contain a nerve toxin, carototoxin. And someone once pointed out that if cabbage had to undergo the tests that drugs are now subjected to before being pronounced fit for humans, it wouldn't pass. Latherism, a kind of nerve paralysis, is a disease once widespread in India, due to eating the lathar spin, a relation of garbanzo or chickpea. Another bin, vishafavia, causes farvism or hemolytic anemia in sensitive individuals living around the Mediterranean Sea. The edible nightshades, potatoes, tomatoes, capsicums, chili peppers, are especially rich sources, but cabbage, peppercorns, pulses and many other foodstuffs are not far behind. Outbreaks of food poisoning due to solanine, from potatoes, tomatine, tomatoes, and diascorine, yams, have all been reliably observed in either humans or domestic animals. Death due to poisoning by plants is fortunately uncommon in humans, in Socrates's case, hemlock, it was deliberate murder by the state. But subclinical poisoning in sensitive individuals occurs all the time. Diet Wise the book, aims to teach you facts you didn't dream of and your doctor does not suspect. Just because the majority of people can eat her food without any apparent symptoms doesn't mean everyone is genetically programmed to do so. Toxicity is a matter of degree but that is little comfort if you are one of the sensitive individuals. Number 9. Hormones. Plants may also contain hormone-like substances. Estrogen precursors are found in yams. Goitrogens are substances causing goiter, swollen neck due to thyroid enlargement. Soabin extract includes significant amounts and goiters have been seen in human infants fed with soya milk. Iodine appears to counteract this effect, so infant soy milks are fortified with iodide as a precautionary measure. Goitrogens are a common constituent of plants belonging to the crucifer family, cabbage, turnip, swede, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, brussels sprouts, rape and mustard seed. Number 10. Hypertensives. Hypertensive substances are amino compounds such as serotonin and noradrenaline, norepinephrine which constrict blood vessels and thereby elevate the blood pressure. Such substances occur in chocolate, pineapple juice, avocado, alcohol and cheese. This is by no means an exhaustive list but sufficient to make the reader realize that there may be a problem, even if nobody has told you before. The real mystery is not so much why people are sometimes made ill by food toxins, so much as why isn't everyone made ill, all the time? I'll give you one important answer further down. Number 11. External Poisons. Poisoning may come into food indirectly. An endemic goiter seen in Tasmania is probably due to milk from cows fed on kale and turnips. A disease known as milk sickness, characterized by weakness, nausea and collapse, has occasionally reached epidemic proportions in certain parts of the USA. It probably caused the death of Abraham Lincoln's mother. The name derives from the fact that the disease is brought on by drinking milk from cows made ill with a disease known as the trembles. This was eventually tracked down to the consumption, by cattle, of a plant known as snake root, Eupatorium ayugasum, containing the chemical trametone. Along the same lines, 
A poison in lupin has been known to be transferred to human beings via goat's milk. Number 12. Plant Alkaloids. One very important group of plant chemicals are the alkaloids. These are small organic molecules, usually comprising several carbon rings with side chains, one or more of the carbon atoms being replaced by a nitrogen, which confers the alkalinity. About 7 to 10 percent of all plants contain alkaloids, of which several thousand are now known. Famous alkaloids include caffeine, nicotine, quinine, strychnine, ergotamine and atropine. The less toxic ones, such as caffeine, are used for pleasant social effects or as hallucinogens, cannabis and peyote. The action of alkaloids on the nervous system is generally to disrupt electrochemical transmission at nerve junctions, synapses, either preventing transmission, as in the case of the plant extract curare, or enhancing it inappropriately, as, for example, physostigmine. Number 13. Psychedelics. Probably the most fascinating study of all is that of psychogenic substances in plants. Best known are the psychedelic substances such as those in marijuana and peyote cactus. The coca plant gives rise to cocaine and the opium poppy is notorious for its forbidden juices. But there have been opium-like substances, called exophins, found in many plants. Exophins are morphine-related peptides derived from partially digested grain, milk and legume proteins. Pharmacologically they behave, when tested on isolated tissues, very much like endorphins, hence the name, endorphins in turn, remember, a natural calming body substance is named for their morphine-like properties. In people whose intestinal digestion is incomplete, exophins are absorbed and have the effect of a small dose of an opiate drug. This may be one of the main reasons that some people find food very soporific and tend to fall asleep after a heavy meal. Number 14. Caffeine Group. Finally, think of the caffeine family, known as methoxanthines. It is commonly overlooked that caffeine and theobramine, which occur in tea, coffee and chocolate, are toxic substances. Taken in sufficient quantities they can cause cerebral edema, so-called water, on the brain, convulsions and even death, though no one has ever been able to establish tissue damage caused by chronic ingestion at normal levels. However I know from my own work that methoxanthines are a potent cause of chronic mastitis in women, sometimes called fibrocystic disease of the breasts, so lumpy breasts. This complaint gives rise to a great deal of anxiety and sometimes leads to complications. The cure is very simple and satisfying, cut the coffee and chocolate. Number 15. Animal Poisons. Let me just conclude here by saying that the animal kingdom does not escape this wide sweep of food toxins. Consider the puffer fish, or fugu. The tetrodotoxin from its liver is so potent that a tiny trace contaminating a knife can kill a man. In Japan, where eating fugu is a macho bravura cult, chefs must be specially licensed and trained to handle this delicacy safely. Nevertheless, there have been many unfortunate deaths due to this cause. I tried it in 1983, in Tokyo. It's pretty tasteless. I can't say it was worth the risk. Doctors disregard foods. It is no big secret that eating right keeps you healthy. Hundreds of thousands of papers are published every year, describing scientific studies which have looked at some aspect of this issue and come to the same inevitable conclusion. The only people who don't seem to have heard the good news are members of the medical profession. I'm not speaking disparagingly of individual doctors, many of my colleagues are very switched on to nutrition and diet. But it is a sad truth that the vast majority of practicing physicians and surgeons have either never heard of the benefits of good nutrition, or have disregarded it or have remained so pathetically ignorant of what is required that they neither teach nor apply the principles of good diet to their suffering patients. A really cynical critic would argue that maybe the doctors don't want their patients restored to health and happiness, that they only want dollars for treating conditions that could be resolved naturally. That may be too harsh. I think the trouble is that doctors never get past nutrition 101 in med school. Instead of becoming competent with this vital tool, they are taught only falsehoods and half-truths.
doctors have it drummed into them that. Number 16. Fats are bad. Whereas in fact certain fats are essential to survival and form part of our all-important cell membranes. Gosh, even our brains are 60% fat, how would we even think without good clean fats? Low-fat diets I see handed out to my doctors are destructive to health because some of our vitamins can only be absorbed in the presence of fats, A, E and D. These vitamins in turn enhance the absorption of essential minerals. Finally, you may know, certain fats are as essential as vitamins, we can't make them but need them or we die. We call these essential fatty acids. The omega-3 series are particularly important and block inflammation, heart disease and a variety of aging and decay processes. Number 17. Carbohydrates are good. It's a medical myth that carbohydrates are desirable and build health, in fact they contribute virtually nothing, other than obesity and insulin problems. White flour and starch have no nutrient qualities, over 90% of B vitamins are removed and only a small fraction of that added back in vitamin enriched flours. Even so called complex carbohydrates, the natural ones, are bad in excess. Consider that farmers, with an eye to profits, fatten up their livestock by feeding them large quantities of carbohydrate. Number 18. Only Traces of Vitamins. Doctors are all taught that only trace doses of vitamins or minerals are necessary for health. The truth is these are merely the levels needed to prevent us dying horribly of scurvy, beriberi and the like. The so-called recommended dietary allowances, DARS bear no relation to the quantities needed for optimum health and do not take into account basic scientific variables, such as the fact that we are all biologically different, we need a higher intake under different conditions, notably disease and stress, or that we may not even be absorbing our nutrients properly. When you are seriously ill with a pathogenic infection, vitamin C requirements go up by over 100 fold. That's how we beat infections. 100-400 grams daily can work wonders. Yet doctors still proclaim we only need 150 milligrams daily, 0.15 grams. Number 19. Good nutrients are bad. Doctors continually perpetuate the myths that doses of vitamins even slightly above daily allowance levels may be dangerous. This is especially ironic when doctors tend to cling to the biochemical nonsense that some is good so more is better. Drug dosages. For example, Americans are told to restrict their vitamin D intake to 200 units and that more is dangerous. Yet scientific studies have proven that we all need 1,500 units a day or more, for its cancer protective effect. A day in bright sunshine brings us about 1,200 units, via the skin. Are they saying nature is stupid or what? In fact pet food contains vitamin doses many times above the supposed safe levels for humans, if you allow for the body weight of smaller mammals, the levels recommended for a healthy beast are hundreds of times greater than those for humans. Number 20. A Balanced Diet Myth. It's standard teaching that a balanced diet will give you all the essential nutrients you need. A balance of what exactly? Junk? Most foods on the supermarket shelf are vitiated makeovers of what nature has supplied and thus severely depleted of essential nutrients. Take zinc as an example, this vital mineral helps build our tissues and maintain immunity. But modern farming methods leave even the soil deficient in zinc. It cannot be taken up by crops and the livestock that feeds on the land, thus the whole food chain is zinc deficient in most areas. It is not possible to obtain adequate doses of this nutrient from your diet, however varied. Fast food is actually an oxymoron. Either it's fast or it's food but it can't be both. Do you remember the movie Super Size Me in which Milton Spurlock, a fit healthy man, showed signs of dangerous liver damage on less than 30 days of continuous McDonald's food? Eating foods that have been altered to create more profit is one sure way to get hurt. Number 21. Food allergies are rare. The official story is that food allergy and intolerance is very rare. Officially, 
Figures still claim that food allergy affects only between 1% and 7% of the population. This is misleading, and such statistics concern only extremely violent food reactions that we call immediate hypersensitivity and which sometimes leads to anaphylaxis and death. But the kind of food allergy you will read about in Dietwise is different. It is subtler and often remains in disguise. The official position is therefore false euphoria and until doctors are taught to diagnose the problem properly, this sort of underestimation of the problem will continue. The truth is that this is very common. It has been described as the unsuspected enemy because nobody usually suspects it. It takes a trained mind to think of it and some skill to know what to do. I have tried to distill most of what I know into a self-help book. If you read it you will be truly diet-wise. Number 22 diseases caused by foods. One of the factors that seem to provoke much of the controversy surrounding food allergy and intolerance is the sheer diversity of conditions it claims to be able to treat. The key to the multiplicity of conditions we encounter is target or shock organs. Simply put, diseases depend not on the allergen or the insult, the toxin, etc. but on which genetic weak link within the body breaks first. Thus we find allergies affecting the skin, lungs, pancreas, endocrine organs, etc. In fact an increasing number of diseases are turning out to have a basis in immune dysfunction, for example, juvenile onset diabetes appears to be an autoimmune disease, in which the patient is attacking and destroying his or her own B cells in the part of the pancreas that secretes insulin, the islets of Langerhans. Misthenia gravis a condition characterized by gradual weakness and paralysis but which can be cured dramatically by drugs, also appears to be immunologically induced. There may ultimately be many similar conditions that come under the same umbrella. In the next few pages here are some tables of diseases and symptoms I have been able to treat successfully over three decades by eliminating bandit foods from the patient's diet. Number 23 conditions which can often be wholly attributable to food allergy. Asthma, eczema, urtic area, rhinitis, seasonal and perennial, catar, colitis, migraine, depression. Number 24. Conditions which may respond well to the food allergy approach. Arthritis, all types but especially rheumatoid, behavioral disorders in children, Crohn's disease eating disorders, anorexia and bulimia, hemorrhoids hyperkinetic syndrome, hyperactivity, hypertension, mastitis or breast pains, Meniere's disease, mouth ulcers, multiple sclerosis, milgic encephalomyelitis, post-viral syndrome, peptic ulcer, polymyalgia, premenstrual tension, psoriasis, recurring cystitis. Number 25. Conditions which may respond to the food allergy or clinical ecology approach. Alcoholism anxiety, cardiac arrhythmias, especially tachycardia, depression, frigidity hypothyroidism, impotence, schizophrenia. Number 26. Subjective symptoms. I have seen countless specialized symptoms caused by food reactions. These are unique to the individual. These can be virtually anything, hot and cold feelings, heart racing after meals, distant thoughts, stone in my stomach, like seeing yourself down a long tunnel, hot water running down the inside of my skin you can imagine that many patients have been told it's all in your head. In a sense that's right, because brain inflammation is the cause. But it's wrong to imply the patient is inadequate, a faker or imagining their symptoms. Number 27. Atopic disease. The atopic individual is defined as one with diverse, acute, type I hypersensitivity reactions. These are usually age mediated, prick test, and rest positive, and the individual usually has a rapid and severe onset of symptoms after encountering an allergen. They tend to share a common group of symptoms including asthma and wheezing, rhinitis, eczema and dread, itchy eyes. The word atopy, meaning strange disease, was coined by Arthur Coker in the 1950s, Atopic patients sensitize easily and are found to react on testing to a whole range of foods and environmental substances including molds, dusts, danders, 
etc. Sometimes this sensitization reaches an extreme degree that can be life-threatening. Unburdening is a considerable problem for these patients because it can be very difficult to find safe foods. Children are more often adopic than adults. Studies have now shown this is caused by childhood vaccinations, which may increase reactions tenfold. However, atopy is not confined to children. Many individuals tend to have problems right throughout their adult lives, so a wait and see what happens policy is rarely justified. Avoidance is the best course and a diet and lifestyle need to be designed that will reduce body load. Nevertheless it is sometimes necessary to resort to drugs for acute episodes of life-threatening bronchospasm or swellings. Number 28. Drunk on everyday foods. Some of my most extraordinary cases, which found their way into press and TV coverage back in the 1980s, were individuals who got literally intoxicated, drunk, eating ordinary foods. One was a girl who reeled when she ate potato. Drunk on fries screened the headlines. Another girl was drunk on vodka and orange, she got up on the table dancing and singing, but it was the orange, not the vodka. Without the orange, the food that was really hurting her, she could drink plenty of vodka and have no ill effects. How can this strange phenomenon occur? Well, remember that alcohol poisons the brain. First it poisons the inhibitory centers. We lose inhibitions and get drunk. But if we drink more, then it poisons everything and we end up under the table, passed out in a stupor. Now I am telling you foods can be just this poisonous to the brain and nervous system. That makes foods pretty deadly. Number 29. Brain Allergy. We call this phenomenon brain allergy. Most doctors have never heard of it. In fact few people know about it and I can tell you that millions of people are in hospital or dosed on psychiatric drugs, because of brain allergy due to everyday foods. One of my patients had been in psychiatric care for over 20 years, dosed up on drugs and given electroconvulsion therapy shock treatment, for depression. She wasn't depressed but allergic to potato. Even as I was carrying out the definitive test and proving the real mechanism of this sad story, her husband was home peeling three pounds of potatoes which they ate every single day, people, as I explain in my book Diet Wise, get addicted to the very foods that are doing them harm. Almost any kind of symptom can be caused by brain allergy. Typical ones are fatigue, low moods, memory lapses, what we call woolly brain syndrome. But it can be frightening and run to full-blown hallucinations and dementia. Number 30 children and banded foods. Who doesn't know that foods can cause children problems, like a DD and a DHD? The medical profession for a start. They continue to poison children with these problems, using drugs which suppress their brains and foreign chemicals are often the last thing that children need. Children cannot study and learn when they are under the influence of even a mild food reaction. When it is severe they become ungovernable and yet they are often punished for being naughty. Take a look at this example from my casebook. The child's normal handwriting is shown, alongside the same child on the same day, trying to write the numbers 1, 10 while undergoing an allergic reaction. You will agree this child is being badly hurt by food reactions. Teachers should know this awful stuff. Number 31. Foods cause sexual arousal. We've all heard of aphrodisiacs, foods that turn you on and make you sexy. Apart from alcohol, I can tell you that there are no such foods. But I will surprise you by reporting that any food can be an aphrodisiac. I have had women, under strict food testing conditions, get really aroused and want to have sex. One woman masturbated immediately after eating the test food, coffee. Another woman in her forties went and had sex with the first youth she saw, dairy produce. These were women who behave respectably normally and had no suspicion that eating these foods caused inappropriate responses. Both felt dirty and ashamed but both learned something priceless about themselves and about food. Now imagine how dangerous that can be for young women especially, to be rendered vulnerable by foods, without alcohol playing a part. Number 32. Epilepsy. Another surprise food reaction, which can be very dangerous is epilepsy. 
I showed this connection in the early 80s and it was greeted by total disbelief from colleagues, they called any kind of food reaction, other than classic allergy, mumbi jumbo. But know this, foods can cause such severe brain irritation that fits and convulsions are the result. One young boy was allergic to anything in the carrot family, celery, parsnips, parsley, fennel, coriander, cilantro, and dill. It sent him into convulsion. He was the one who spotted all these plants have the same frondy green tops. I proved my point in 1984 when I got a man's driving license back. Wheat was the cause of his problem and he did not have epilepsy but a food allergy. Number 33. Binging and overweight. Binging of foods is a sure sign of reacting. It was often amusing the way an individual would be completely hooked on his or her banded foods. In fact my initial survey at the office began with how often foods were consumed. Those on the list of daily foods were nearly always the troublemakers. I'm talking real addiction, if the individual doesn't eat the food for a few hours, then symptoms start to make life uncomfortable. Another dose of the food and the symptoms would go away. That's the reason a lot of people wake up grabby and are slow getting started in the morning. 8 to 12 hours off the food can result in unpleasant withdrawals. Then along comes breakfast wheat, corn, dairy, sugar or whatever and the symptoms quickly clear. It's not always the obvious thing, by the way. Someone drinking coffee by the clock every couple of hours may seem addicted to coffee or caffeine, try decaffeinated and see if the headache comes on. But time and again I found that the real addiction was the milk in the coffee. In other words, black coffee was fine. Number 34. Eating disorders. Talk about surprise ways foods can really hurt. Believe it or not, food reactions of the kind I am talking about can be the cause of eating disorders. Binging and bulimia are obviously similar. What about anorexia? A woman binges foods she is allergic to. That makes her feel ill, so she hardly eats for several weeks. Then the addiction grabs her again and the cycle repeats, over and over. Finally, she all but quits eating. She loses weight. They say she has anorexia. Oh no. This is a food allergy. I'm not saying all anorexia or binging is a food allergy or intolerance. What I am saying is that in every case this possible cause must be clearly sought for and corrected. Otherwise the woman will be subjected to needless drug and psychiatric interventions. Number 35. Respiratory cripple. How bad can it get? One of my patients taught me a lot. His parents brought him to me as a 12-year-old, with severe asthma. He was taking stacks of medication, which didn't really help. The life he lived could best be described as that of a respiratory cripple. He could hardly walk needed an oxygen tank constantly by his side and so was almost housebound. Long story short, he was allergic to several simple foods such as egg. Once I had established this and got him off the foods he made a complete recovery. No more medication, no more wheezing. Last I heard he was playing rugby football for his university squad. I've seen asthma caused by foods over and over. Doctors wrongly assume that inhalant substances, such as dust and animal danders must be the cause of allergic asthma. They are breathed and so go to the lungs, right? Wrong. It really makes no difference how the allergens get to the blood, as soon as it does it will pass through the fine capillaries of the lungs. Duh. When that happens, of course, the allergic reaction can kick off just as if the substance had been breathed. Ironically I have seen food allergens as inhalants too. Like the baker who was allergic to wheat he breathed while at his work, flour and farina dust, or the woman allergic to corn who got a face full every time she fed her horse. Number 36. What causes bandit foods? The mechanisms underlying food reactions are far-reaching and complex, including overload, toxicity, true allergy, intolerance etc. Remember, more than one mechanism may be operating in your case. Unfortunately, we run into a problem right away, which is that there is no real consensus agreement on exactly what constitutes an allergic reaction. The water is made muddy by classic allergists, scared of infringements on their lucrative territory, 
claiming that only they deal with real allergies. Their representatives' bodies, such as the American College of Allergy and Immunology, continue to produce position papers, which effectively dismiss anyone else's view as fraud. But in their eager fury to try to destroy the competition, they leave vast armies of patients high and dry. To merely negate anything other than the classical allergy model is to fail to address the many different and similar mechanisms by which external triggers can cause disease in unlucky individuals but not in the population at large. I have always worked with the very simple shorthand definition of allergy which in layman's terms is, something you should avoid because you will feel better if you do. This empirical, hands-on, approach is based on the following clinical criteria. The substance can be shown to cause a patient harm that is an avoidance of it brings about a recovery reintroduction of the substances causes a recurrence of similar symptoms there is no other obvious cause of the affliction this is eminently sensible and is how the term is used today in popular usage. The layman does not need to know the mechanisms of allergy, hypersensitivity and intolerance but can readily grasp the concept of something to avoid. Number 37 historic view of food allergy. Let us take an overview and see if this leads to more understanding, starting with the historical perspective. The word allergy was first coined by an Austrian pediatrician, Clemens von Perke, in 1906. He defined an allergy as an acquired, specific, altered capacity to react to a physical substance on the part of the tissues of the body. This description is worth considering in more detail. Acquired means that it is not inborn or constitutional, though there is no doubt that the tendency to allergies runs in families. In what is now the classic allergic reaction, an individual must meet the substance, at least once, and the allergy results from this initial sensitizing encounter. Babies that appear to be born with an allergy do not really conflict with this theory. It's just that they made their first contact while in the womb, with, for example, a food in the mother's diet. Specific means that it is not a generalized reaction but relates to one exact substance or, in reality, often a small part of a molecule of that substance. An individual may react to many things at once but each reaction is unique. Even if several allergens, allergy-causing substances, provoke the same effect, it is simply that the final end organ stimulated is the same in each case. Altered means the reaction is not normal. In other words, not everyone shares the same experience. The majority of our species would probably not react in the way an allergic patient does. For example, most of us eat tomatoes safely, yet some people cannot do so without risking a severe asthma attack or some other unpleasant consequence. However, there are difficulties in this last interpretation. Once you start to move outside the immunological guidelines for an allergy, phenomena such as an allergy to wheat become very common. Probably half the population or more don't tolerate it anything like as well as they suppose, once you start asking the right questions. We may retain the adjective altered perhaps, but such reactions may be anything but rare or unusual. Furthermore, when it comes to a matter such as low-grade poisoning, see below, then substances that induce symptoms are toxic for everyone. Allergy then becomes only a matter of degree. Sensitive people react to levels of the toxin that would be tolerated by the average individual. In the 1920s the sort of reaction von Perke was talking about was commonly found to have an immunological basis, i.e. it was an antigen-antibody phenomenon. Apparently, the body was responding to foreign protein and even food is considered foreign by the body since it is non-self, by mounting an antibody attack. The spin-off from this interaction, rather like fallout from a chemical battle, was what gave rise to the unwanted and inappropriate symptoms experienced by the patient. Number 38. Non-immunological causes. There is something radically wrong, however, with the simplistic and narrow definition above, though immunologists cling to it like a raft at sea. The great paradox, as pointed out by Professor John Suthill, personal communication, is that if this explanation were true, we all ought to get allergic reactions to food every time we eat. Obviously this doesn't happen. Somehow the body knows not to react against food protein. 
Notwithstanding this inconsistency, since the 1920s the definition of allergies has been entirely an immunological one. Any reaction outside this perimeter has been considered conveniently to be not an allergy. The fact that such reactions do seem to exist, and have been reported often, has been ignored. The patient's symptoms are apparently all in the mind. Unfortunately for those who stand by this rhetoric, even as early as 1920 Dr. Albert Rowe and others were able to demonstrate that there were clear reactions to ingested substances and that these could be established to exist beyond any doubt, regardless of the lack of adequate explanation. Since these reactions also accord with von Perke's original definition, there seemed nothing wrong with calling them allergy, in this case, food allergy. There was no real controversy at the time, since Rowe was not an internationally known figure. He continued his seminal researches, wrote his book Food Allergy, Its Manifestations, Diagnosis and Treatment, Leon Febiger, Philadelphia, 1931, and departed the world stage. However, his successors, notably Randolph, Wrinkle and Zare, authors of Food Allergy, Charles C. Thomas, Springfield, Illinois, 1951, carried on Rose work and, particularly since the 1950s, the proof that dietary allergies could exist without there being any demonstrable antibodies became steadily more and more compelling, to the embarrassment of immunologists. If these immunologists admitted the existence of food allergy at all, they'd say it was very rare and applied only to a very tiny minority of the population. Randolph, Wrinkle and Zare were finding far too many cases. As the debate hotted up in the 1970s and 1980s the two groups polarized and antagonism grew more unpleasant. To ease the situation, the term food intolerance was introduced in a booklet published jointly in 1984 by the Royal College of Physicians and the British Nutrition Foundation. This was an attempt to try and accommodate the fact that unpleasant reactions to food clearly did exist but nonetheless the die-hard immunologists wouldn't give in and allow the term allergy to be applied. In many ways this was a poor compromise, especially since proponents of the term cannot provide any explanation of how intolerance comes about. Other Known Mechanisms Number 39. Lectins. Lectins are carbohydrate-binding proteins present in most plants, especially seeds and tubers like cereals, potatoes, and beans. One of the most toxic substances known, ricin, is a lectin, see hashed 7. Until recently their main use was in identifying bloods groups but in the past two decades we have realized that not all lectins are helpful and some are downright toxic and inflammatory, or both. Unfortunately, lectins are resistant to cooking and digestive enzymes and so they pass unchanged into the body. Some certainly get into the blood and can cause severe damage. Wheat lectin, called gliadin, which is present in gluten, can damage the intestinal wall, leading to celiac disease. But gliadin can also deposit in the kidneys and may cause permanent damage to the kidney tubules. Ultimately this is life-threatening and so lectins are a serious problem. My old colleague David Freed told this interesting story in the British Medical Journal a few years ago. In 1988 a hospital launched a healthy eating day in its staff canteen at lunchtime. One dish contained red kidney beans, and 31 portions were served. At 3 p.m. one of the customers, a surgical registrar, vomited in theater. Over the next four hours ten more customers suffered profuse vomiting, some with diarrhea. All had recovered by next day. No pathogens were isolated from the food but the beans contained an abnormally high concentration of the lectin phytohamagglutinin, which was presumed to be the cause of the outbreak. Number 40. Pharmacological Effects. Substances, including foods, can act like drugs. For example tea and coffee contain caffeine. It's quite toxic. See here the results of an experiment carried out by NASA, spiders were fed several substances, some obvious poisons, one was caffeine. As you can see, the spider fed benzedrine wasn't up to it mentally, the one given marijuana kind of chilled out and couldn't finish the task, coral hydrate Mickey Finn, simply put the spider to sleep before it had done much. 
But worst of all was the spider-fed caffeine, which just lost it totally. What if caffeine does that to our brains? Number 41. Chemical Sensitivity. This one is similar to pharmacology but, of course, chemicals may have toxic effects as well as drug-like reactions. Some people are super sensitive to chemicals and pollution. Remember foods are really quite complex mixtures of chemicals, some of which are toxic. I have already pointed out that carrot, for example, contains a chemical akin to nerve gas. We will see shortly a very complex group of food ingredients, called phenols. These are related to carbolic acid. Phenols give rise to the main colors and flavors in food, so they are important. It doesn't mean they cannot hurt us. The so-called excitotoxins. The next group of substances, are often found in food, yes, even in nature's foods, such as palm sago. Recognition of the problems caused by this group of foods has been a big step forward in bringing to light the abuses of manufactured foods. Neurons, nerve cells, in the brain exposed to these substances initially become very excited, firing rapidly until they become completely exhausted. Then hours later these neurons suddenly die. It's as if the cells were excited to death. So the name excitotoxin seems appropriate. Excitotoxins found in nature are all amino acids including glutamate, aspartate and cysteine. Add a sodium molecule to the glutamate and you have monosodium glutamate. But the toxic part is the glutamate, not the sodium. These compounds are especially harmful to children, who do not have the protection of what we call the blood-brain barrier, which means toxins can enter the brain easily. The irony is that many infant formulas contain compounds of this class. I will examine just two, monosodium glutamate and aspartame. Number 42. Monosodium glutamate. MSG. Processed food is really so denatured, bland and unpalatable that nobody would eat it, unless the flavors were enhanced. The most common way of faking flavor is adding monosodium glutamate or one of its relatives. Names to look for on the label are hydrolyzed vegetable protein and modified vegetable starch. Message and these similar compounds are all made by soaking rotten or otherwise unwanted vegetables in acid until they turn to brown sludge, caustic soda is then added to counter the acid. The final filth is added to what you eat from cans and packages, on the assurance they are safe and even good for you. Again there are lies galore. Aware that most people nowadays are suspicious of message, manufacturers have taken to hiding its presence with labels that say no message, no message added, or no added message, even though their products contain message and glutamate, or close relatives such as ammonium glutamate. We know that as well as damaging the brain, message will cause food addictions and is a surprising cause of obesity. Neurons, nerve cells exposed to large doses of message die within one hour. With a smaller dose they die suddenly in two hours. Why would we eat large doses of message then? Because it's hidden in your food and you don't know what you're eating. According to one study restaurants add as much as 9.9 .9 grams of message to a single dish, enough to cause brain damage in experimental animals. In soups or other liquids, message is absorbed much faster and more completely causing higher blood levels of message and greater toxicity to the brain. Number 43. Aspartame. Aspartame is the only synthetic food ingredient I refer to in this entire rebook. All the deadly food reactions I have listed are caused by nature's own food components. Glutamate is found in natural plants, such as cycad palm, and was the cause of a huge outbreak of Lujaric disease in Guam, just after World War II. In fact that's how excitotoxins were first discovered. Unfortunately, aspartame is decidedly a member of the excitotoxin group and needs some mention here. Due to clever spinning aspartame has got a reputation as a diet product, implying it is healthy or good for us. It is not. The irony is that it does not help with weight loss. Aspartame causes carbohydrate cravings. It is far more likely to make you gain weight. Aspartame decays to methanol in the body. We all know what meth's drinking leads to. Cooking with aspartame accelerates the methanol production, 
so it is a very bad idea as a baking ingredient. In one report, when diet sodas and soft drinks, sweetened with aspartame, are used to replace fluid lost during exercise and physical exertion in hot climates, the intake of methanol can exceed 250 mg slash day or 32 times the Environmental Protection Agency's recommended limit of consumption for this cumulative poison. Aspartame is especially bad for children, as all excitotoxins are. Yet parents are encouraged to feed their children aspartame because it's better for them than sugar. Aspartame is also dangerous for diabetics. It can send blood sugar out of control. Cases of retinopathy, a dangerous complication of diabetes, leading to possible blindness, were often no more than aspartame poisoning and were reversed as soon as the aspartame was stopped. Aspartame is a serious neurotoxin and brain deterioration can lead to seizures, depression, manic depression, panic attacks, uncontrollable anger and rage. There is interesting history to this food scam. For over eight years, the FDA refused to approve Nutra Sweet, Searle's brand name for aspartame, because of the seizures and brain tumors this drug produced in lab animals. The FDA continued refusing to approve it until President Reagan took office and fired the FDA commissioner who refused to approve it. Dr. Arthur Hull Hayes Jr. was appointed as commissioner. Even then there was so much opposition to approval that a board of inquiry was set up. But Hayes overruled his own board of inquiry, claiming there was new science showing it was safe, no new evidence was ever produced. After Commissioner Hayes approved the use of aspartame in carbonated beverages, he left for a lucrative position with G.D. Searle. So, surprise. Not really. Number 44. Mental Illness. In 1966 Dr. F. C. Dohan published a famous paper, suggesting that schizophrenia could be caused by a food allergy, namely gluten. He's right, I can tell you that. But it's not confined to gluten or even cereals, his paper was titled Cereals and Schizophrenia. I've seen it with many foods. One story I describe in detail in Diet Wise concerns a youth who reacted mainly to cheese. Whenever he ate the food, he would journey off into the mental wilderness, talking with dead people, completely unhinged. But a few days after giving up cheese he would recover himself. Providing he avoided cheese he was pretty well normal, nobody is 100% mentally okay, right? Depression can also be caused by food reactions. So can mania or so-called bipolar disorder. I've solved the problem for hundreds of such cases. Historically, the first ever mention of food intolerance and depression is in a famous book published in 1621 called The Anatomy of Melancholy by Robert Burton, a cleric from Oxford, England. Burton wrote milk, and all that comes of milk, as butter and cheese, curds etc. increase melancholy, whey only accepted, which is most wholesome, some accept asses milk. The rest, to such as are sound, is nutritive and good, especially for young children, but because soon turned to corruption, not good for those that have unclean stomachs, a subject to headache. I like his word corruption for acquired food intolerance. Incidentally, I cite this book also as the earliest example of what we now call journaling. Burton was prone to melancholy himself and wrote his tract to try and lift himself out of it. Anatomy of Melancholy is available online as a text file from www.gutenberg.net. There are no page numbers but you can use search or find to trace references to milk. Always think of food allergy and intolerance, not madness. Number 45. Phenols in Foods. Phenol is also known as carbolic acid, the stuff that you'd better not swallow that we use to clean drains. Phenolic compounds color and flavor foods. Their toxicity may protect the natural plants against microorganisms. They also help in the dispersal and germination of seeds and attract flower pollinators because of their scent. Some individual phenolic compounds have been correlated with specific disorders. Tyramine and nicotine, for example, are implicated in migraine and headaches. A little experience with phenol families leads to new diagnostic skills in allergy. For example, a patient sensitive to cheese, beef, banana and potato might really be sensitive to nicotine. 
In 1979, Dr. Robert Gardiner, Ph.D., professor of animal science at Brigham Young University, began to speculate that his own allergies might be caused by sensitivity to some aromatic compounds found naturally in all plant foods and pollens. He acquired some of these pure compounds, made serial dilutions and started sublingual tests, monitoring changes in his own pulse rate. He experienced reactions to various extracts and neutralizing doses were found for each compound. Gardner found that neutralizing doses of these compounds would kill his allergic reactions to specific foods. After several months he had succeeded in neutralizing many of his own dietary allergies and he was able to eat most foods without reactions. He experienced a major improvement in his health. A colleague began to hunt for phenolic compounds in foods and found, for example, that cow's milk contains 13, tomato 14, and soya 9. The table shows the phenolic content of some common food substances. Neutralizing phenols in food, or avoiding them, of course, has been particularly successful with infants and children, giving excellent results in cases of autism, mental retardation. A DD and a DHD, dyslexia, insomnia, enresis, respiratory allergies, headaches, abdominal pains and asthma. In adults, remissions have been achieved in many chronic problems including migraine, fatigue, depression, asthma, arthritis, colitis, hypertension, menstrual disorders, dermatological problems, chronic constipation and cardiac arrhythmias. Could phenols protect us? There is the possibility that phenolics may protect us in some way. Many foods contain harmful lectins, which should have a severely damaging effect on our gut and indeed the body as a whole. We ought to suffer more than, in practice, we do. Perhaps phenolics are shielding us? And one experiment has shown that the phenolic root in, cytin, has a protective effect against mast cell disintegration. Mast cells in the body trigger allergic reactions to substances. Maybe these phenols work like drugs, too. Number 46. Enzyme Deficiencies. Enzymes are what we use to digest our foods, among other functions. If an individual lacks an enzyme, then he or she cannot tolerate the food well. You may have heard of lactose intolerance. That means the lack of an enzyme called lactase which the body uses to digest lactose, the sugar in milk. Individuals with this condition suffer abdominal pain and discomfort, bloating and wind, whenever they consume milk, even if it's hidden in cooking. The difficulty comes when newborn babies suffer lactose intolerance. They may experience profuse diarrhea which can lead to life-threatening dehydration and loss of vital electrolytes, body chemicals. Early research into this problem was carried out in Manchester, UK, by my old professor Aaron Holzell and we now understand the condition a lot better. Special formulas are available for these infants and usually treatment is begun even before they are discharged from the obstetric unit. Lactose accounts for a startling 25% of all carbohydrate in the average Western diet. It is present as 40% of milk solids, cows goats and ewes. This percentage rises to over 50% in skimmed milk and whey but is less in whole cream and yogurt. Butter and cheese have almost no lactose. Number 47. Minor Genetic Variations. Modern discoveries have led us to a much clearer understanding of why we all react differently to foods and why food sometimes really hurt an individual. The secret lies in minor genetic variations we call single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs or SNPs for short. This only came to light with the discovery of the human genome. The DNA theory was treated with the usual reckless scientific folly and everybody believed it absolutely and that it must be the way things work. In fact plotting the DNA sequence for humans has led to one shock after another. For one thing there are only around 20,000 genes, not enough to create a human, never mind distinct humans. Many plants have more genes than we do. The second surprise is that, genetic variations aside, the gene codes are often faulty and can vary quite considerably from what they should be. It's like the book of life but with numerous misspellings. 
any severe disruption of DNA would result in a non-viable offspring which would simply die and be deleted. But tiny variations, the so-called SNPs, are common and are quite survivable. The only result may be shortage or lack of a certain protein or enzyme. Lack of an enzyme, see hash 46, can mean the inability to metabolize a food and so its products become toxic. In other words endless minor genetic variations result in endless variations in food tolerances. In most situations I no longer think of food allergy, as we used to call it. I think of SNPs instead. There is good and bad news in this gene story. We now know that most genes can switch on and off. By choosing your own unique and perfect diet, as I tell you how to do it in my book Diet Wise, you can switch on the genes for good health and longevity. You can also switch off the bad genes for heart disease, cancer and early death. Doing it right can save your life, literally. It's that important. A stands for Adn. T for thymine, C for cytosine, and G for guanine. Our genes are based on these four simple nucleotides, found in strings of eight. A sequence might run CCTG or CTA. A variation called a single nucleotide polymorphism, means other shape, might run CTTG or CTA. A little thing that can lead to big trouble every time you eat. Number 48. So how do you know? How do you know if this problem of food reactions applies to you? Dr. Richard McCannus gave five key symptoms that point the way to food allergy and intolerance, in fact allergic illness in general, and that have special importance. He believed that without one of the following symptoms, the diagnosis is unlikely, 1, 2, 3, 4 or 5. Over, or underweight or fluctuating weight persistent fatigue that isn't helped by rest. Occasional swellings around the eyes, hands, abdomen, ankles, etc. Palpitations or speeded heart rate, particularly after meals excessive sweating, not related to exercise. It needs mentioning that there should be no other explanation for these symptoms. Number 49. Symptoms that could be caused by food allergy and intolerance, SNPs etc. List like these are really lists of a body under stress and are not unique to food intolerance or allergy. Nevertheless, if may be useful to review them, red or itchy eyes, bronchitis, asthma, itching, eczema, blotches on the skin, mouth ulcers, dyspepsia, abdominal distress, flatulence, abdominal bloating, pain the stomach, constipation, diarrhea, variable bowel function, unusually slow or rapid heartbeat, pain in the chest, high blood pressure, cramps in limbs, chillblains, feeling faint, feeling unwell all over, stiffness in throat or tongue, water retention, terrible thoughts on waking, shaking in the morning, slow getting started in the morning, insomnia, crabby on waking, difficulty waking up, abrupt changes of state from well to unwell, rash that isn't eczema, aching muscles, swollen painful joints, headache, including migraine, convulsions or fits, ringing in the ears giddiness nausea, frequent urination, dopey feeling, brain fog, inability to think clearly woolly brain, irritability, panic attacks, feeling unreal, depersonalized lack of confidence, mood swings, sudden sneezing, high mood, undue elation, low mood mood swings, menstrual difficulties, general slowing down, general speeding up, tingling all over, vomiting without nausea, sudden tiredness after eating, sudden chills after eating, feeling totally drained and exhausted, eating binges flu-like state that isn't flu, kadar. Number 50. The number one question. Over the years, I learned that one magic question, more than all the others, gave the strongest pointer to allergy and intolerance. Do your symptoms come and go frequently? Healthy one day, are the next, then well again a couple of days later is a huge waving banner, which gives away the whole story to an alert physician. An allergy or intolerance reaction, to food or to other substances, is almost the only pathological mechanism which will give rise to this quickly shifting pattern. Think about it. Infection with microorganisms will not come and go in this manner, if you have an infection it will take at least a week or more to clear, 
however brilliant your immune system. Parasites and certain stealth viruses may not declare themselves at all but are certainly not going to appear and disappear within the body over a matter of hours or days. Degenerative diseases progress steadily, if you have diabetes, arthritis, arteriosclerosis or other cardiovascular damage, macular degeneration of the retina, diverticulitis or senescent skin, then you will experience long slow changes with very little relapse, unless you follow the advice in the Diet Wise book. Tumors, malignant or benign, enlarge steadily and do not shrink one day and reappear the next. No, sudden inflammation, due to an allergy or intolerance is about the only disease process which has this characteristic abrupt and intermittent behavior. The body is basically sound but something is attacking it on a frequent basis, often daily, as we shall see. The corollary to this number one question, incidentally, gives rise to one of my most valuable sayings and one which inspired patients the most, if you can be symptom free on any day you can be symptom free every day. It's obvious. If even just one day a year all symptoms clear up and you feel fine, then there is nothing structurally wrong nothing missing, no broken parts, no fatal flaw in your body's defenses and especially no genes. In the classic phrase, there is a healthy you inside, just waiting to get out. You're really fine. But, of course, you need to know what it is that is knocking you off healthy and well. That's the culprit I'm calling an allergy or intolerance. The chances are it, or they, is a food. Diet-wise. Let your body choose the food that's right for you. If, after reading this e-book, you decide you would like to pursue matters further and need help, you can do no better than purchase a copy of Dr. Keith Scott Mumby's book Dietwise. You can get a copy from the website, www.dietwisebook.com. Who is Dr. Keith? Keith Scott Mumby is a British MD now permanently resident in California. Throughout the late 1970s and 80s Dr. Keith was at the forefront of a movement which pioneered discoveries about the way food allergy and environmental pollution could make us ill, sometimes very ill. In 1990 he was christened the world's number one allergy detective. He showed, through a series of remarkable case histories, that foods can hurt an individual very badly. Examples include a woman imprisoned in her own mind, unable to function. Until at the age of 39, Dr. Keith discovered her allergy to a common food. She was instantly released and in her own moving words one day I woke up and realized I was there. In 1987 he made world medical legal history when a UK Crown Court accepted his evidence that an allergy to food could make a youth murderously violent. He had tried to strangle his stepfather. The boy was Irish and the food allergy was potato the irony of which led to a considerable media fest. Children suffer particularly badly and can be ungovernable and unteachable due to their reactions to food. One four-year-old boy was so violent he literally tore a door from its hinges while under the influence of a food reaction, it's not hard to see how such a case would grow up with criminal tendencies. Indeed, Dr. Keith has boasted he could empty out half the prisons in any country. These undetected reactions to food have rightly been called the unsuspected enemy. Dr. Keith is on record with the BBC when interviewed as saying everyone has a food allergy. It may not be important for some, but for others it is a disaster and leads to a blighted life, unless someone with sufficient skill uncovers the problem. Today we think in terms of genetic food incompatibility, rather than just food allergy but the results are just as destructive and far commoner than is generally realized. Until found and corrected, this is one of the major causes of pathogenesis in the civilized world. People are used to thinking of food as nourishing and necessary. But foods are merely a composite of complex chemicals. If the individual lacks specific enzyme pathways to deal with some of these ingredients, then food can become as toxic as deadly nightshade or poisonous toad's teals. Dr. Keith decided on a book for the American market which encapsulated his amazing knowledge, acquired from over three decades at the top of his game. It's in self-help format and tells the reader every step in the process of tracking down hidden food reactions. 
filled with case examples and supportive explanations, it will live up to its name and make the reader truly diet wise. As Dr. Keith points out, this is the book that is missing from the diet market.